And now it's a pleasure to introduce a dear friend of mine, uh, Gary Sullivan, who uh, I had the joy of working with on the Harbor of Home project, a project that looked at the furniture and clocks of southeastern Massachusetts. Gary has been involved in the antique trade for over 30 years, and he is currently involved in a comprehensive study of American musical clocks. And today, he's going to be sharing with us his discoveries on the trade between New England and the South in the area of clocks. Please join me in welcoming Gary Sullivan. Tom Savage that I would try to tone down my wicked high Boston accent <laughs> in, in hopes that all y'all would be able to understand it. So hopefully I can do that. Uh, I'll be speaking today about northern clockmakers and their trade with the South. Uh, not so much about the clocks themselves, but the way they conducted business and uh, some of their clients in the, in the South and their agents that sold clocks for them in the South. Uh, the period that I'll be covering is basically the first quarter of the 19th century. Um, and that was the heyday for clock making by individual craftsmen. Uh, once you get past about 1825, it's not individual craftsmen anymore. It's more of production and clocks coming out of factories. And prior to 1800, it wasn't that much uh, clock activity in the South. Uh, there were actually a number of of clock and watchmakers who worked in the South throughout the period, but they were primarily repairmen and, uh, and, and agents uh, rather than actual manufacturers uh, like the clock makers in New England. Uh, the first decade of the 19th century was pretty good to the New England clock makers, uh, but then as the War of 1812 approached, things got a little bit uh, a little bit tighter, and some of them. Uh, sought to expand their market into a uh, southern market, which was largely untapped. Um, one craftsman who uh, chose to do that was William McCabe, a, uh, a gentleman from Concord, Massachusetts. And uh, in, in re regarding the climate, in 1811, he wrote, business of every kind extremely bad, embargo laws in full force, war expected. Uh, it was a pretty bleak picture. So uh, other craftsmen, in addition to uh, Monroe, uh, tried to find a, a market in the South. I think it's appropriate to begin the lecture talking about the Willards uh, from Boston. I'm sure you've all heard of them. Here we have uh, brothers Simon and Aaron Willard. Um, they, uh, they were the most significant clockmaking family in American history. Uh, Simon Willard on the left uh, invented and patented the banjo clock, or patent timepiece as it was called, in 1802, and that revolutionized clockmaking. Uh, prior to that, a, a waiter of the clock had to be the size of a grandfather clock, and he reconfigured it so that you could run a clock for a week on a, a very short uh, weight drop, and that changed everything. Um, the uh, southern consumers knew the name of Willard. Um, the, the name has always been synonymous with quality clock making. So a wealthy client in the South who was seeking a clock very likely would be uh, seeking a Willard clock if he could find one. Uh, the Willards had agents that sold their clocks in the South, and uh, some of those agents put their own name on them. Some actually bear the, the Willard name. Uh, and that name carried enough weight that uh, a New, or New Orleans merchant, Thaddeus Mayhew, ran an ad in the, uh, in the local paper in 1819 in French. And that ad stated that uh, he had two Willard's patent timepieces, or banjo clocks, and one tall clock that had just arrived from Boston on the ship Union. Uh, so their, their name was important throughout the country. The U.S. government bought at least three clocks from, uh, from Simon Willard, including this one, which still stands in the old uh, Supreme Court building in Washington, D.C. 
Uh, he also sold one uh, to the uh, to the U.S. Senate. Uh, this clock was, uh, was made in 1837, and it uh, it's always been set just a few minutes fast, so that uh, it, it, in order to try to ensure that the justices are on time. Uh, when uh, Thomas Jefferson needed a, a tower clock for the rotunda at the University of uh, Virginia, uh, he called upon Simon Willard to make a uh, clock movement that would be what was similar to this. Uh, the rotunda burned in, in 1895, and this is the replacement. But uh, uh, the Willards had a, had a long reach. When this gentleman, uh, Luke Kiernan, um, was looking to buy a clock, he was from Baltimore. He knew the Willard name. Uh, he was actually the, uh, the first merchant to do direct trade between Baltimore and Liverpool. Uh, he was a very wealthy man who could afford any clock that he wanted from, from any place, any country. But he chose a Simon Willard clock. Um, this is one that, uh, that's at the uh, Wilton House Museum in Richmond. It's a spectacular clock, monumental, it's gigantic. Uh, the case is uh, one that I attribute to Major Stephen Badlam, a significant Dorchester, Massachusetts cabinet maker. Um, and you have to visualize this clock when it would have had its original fretwork, it's just a, a superb example. And that is one of the many clocks that were made by the Willards that still reside in the South. There are a number of clocks of this type that were shipped to the South. Uh, they're, they're very unusual, um, and, and you don't typically find them in Massachusetts, but they have this, uh, this dish dial, it's a circular concave dial that is uh, surrounded by these Eglomose paintings on the uh, on the glass, and these are very late tall clocks. They were made about 1820, and that's a period when almost no tall clocks were being produced in in Boston. It was strictly banjo clocks at that point. But a number of these were made to go to the South. Uh, they were made by Aaron Willard and Aaron Willard Jr. Um, the uh, Petersburg Virginia partnership of Bennett and Thomas, when they dissolved in 1819, they owed Aaron Willard Jr. $500, which was undoubtedly for clocks that were bought on credit, and, uh, and that was a tremendous amount of money at the time. Uh, here's another one very similar. This one was made by Aaron Willard, and it has his label in it, uh, but on the uh, the dial, it signed John McKee, Chester, South Carolina. So this was one of Willard's agents who was selling clocks in the South. And there's the, uh, the label inside, it reads common house clocks, table spring clocks, and timepieces of different constructions made by Aaron Willard in Boston. So this carries both names. Here's another one of the same form. This one is signed William Mitchell Jr., Richmond, Virginia, uh, also attributed to, uh, to Aaron Willard. This clock bears the stencil of Henry Willard. Uh, he worked at Aaron Willard's compound in Boston. Uh, it says Henry Willard, clockmaker, manufacturer, uh, 843 Washington Street in Boston. There are a number of clocks of this type. It's a more traditional Roxbury case form. Uh, this one is attributed to Aaron Willard. It's not signed by him, but uh, the case is certainly made in, in Boston. And uh, inside it has these, these two wonderful uh, paper labels uh, of William McCabe from, from Richmond. Uh, there's a close-up of, uh, of his setup label on how to put the clock in motion. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, he says he, that he has uh, clocks sold, repaired, and warranted by William McCabe. Interesting to note that he doesn't say made by William McCabe, which is what you would typically find on a clockmaker's label. This label is also in the clock. This is his, his watch paper, designed to be cut out and placed inside a watch when, uh, when he repairs it. It includes a wonderful uh, Masonic uh, motto. It says, the silent rest and secret heart preserves the mystery of the art. That's around the outside of the label. <coughs> Here's another clock that appears to be um, a Roxbury case, probably a Willard. Um, this is attributed to Aaron Willard. Uh, this was sold at, uh, at Sotheby's in 1995 with a dial assigned Edward Lawton, Richmond, who was active 1799 to 1811. 
Um, this is uh, uh, this. This is a relatively unknown uh, clock maker. Obviously, he was a uh, he was a merchant selling clocks. Uh, here's a clock that many of you will be familiar with. It's a Colonial Williamsburg uh, spectacular regional case. It's descended in the Pfeiffer Quinn family of Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, this uh, this has a Boston dial, a very unusual one, with these uh, upright numerals. Um, the uh, whether the works were made locally or, or in Boston, I don't know. But the the, uh, the dial was certainly manufactured in, in Boston and, and uh, shipped shipped to the south. Um, these uh, these clocks. Uh, uh, oh, this is McKee's uh, setup label which is inside. It says uh, uh, J. McKee Clock Factory, Chester Courthouse, South Carolina. Is made and sold all kinds of clocks with or without cases, packed up and warranted to go safe to any distance. Uh, they would have to be packed safe to go to any distance because he was a seven, uh, 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 about 175 miles from the coast. So these clocks would have had to have been shipped uh, overland to get to him. And uh, when I first started this project, I was wondering how they actually shipped these clocks. But we uh, we can get a feeling for how they were packed when Thomas Jefferson was giving instructions on how he would like the clock packed up that was being shipped to him from Philadelphia. He said it should be wrapped in coarse woolen blankets, put in a well-jointed case, the whole covered in oil cloth, and then sent to sea. So that, that I would assume, is, is how they did it. Um, here's another uh, clock uh, by McKee. This is a more, this is a standard Roxbury case, uh, again, attributed to, uh, uh, to Willard. Uh, this clock has Aaron Willard's label inside it, and, and the, the case is attributed to Henry Willard. Um, McKee had limited training as a, as a clockmaker. He inherited clockmaker's tools when his, uh, when his brother died, so uh, he was really just selling and repairing clocks and not manufacturing them. There's the label, the, the label type that's inside it. Uh, this is a uh, clock by L. Nathan Tabor. He was a Simon Willard apprentice, um, and this is a clock that, uh, that Sumter and Christopher Jones had a few years ago. Uh, it is from Robert Beverly, um, and uh, his plantation was called Landfield in Essex County, Virginia. Now, this was a very wealthy man. Again, he could have purchased a clock from anywhere he wanted. He chose to uh, uh, to buy a clock that came from from Boston. And uh, uh, this is, uh, that's how wealthy he was. Uh, he, he, uh, uh, his uh, plantation consisted of uh, over 100,000 acres. So he was a, uh, an extremely wealthy gentleman. Uh, the Monroe brothers of Concord, Massachusetts uh, did significant trade in the, in the South. Um, it consisted of three brothers, William, who was a cabinet maker, and he sometimes marked his, uh, his cases with his initials. Um, and he specialized in making clock cases for his brothers, Nathaniel and Daniel, who were clock makers. And they, uh, they, as I say, they did significant business in the, in the South. And uh, William made cases for his brother Daniel, who was not a very good businessman. Daniel owed him money for the cases, uh, and this is how uh, William worked it out. He says uh, uh, in his memoirs, uh, In working for my brother Daniel and furnishing him with clock and timepiece cases, I had accumulated a debt against him, which being difficult for him to pay or me to collect, I accepted from him about ten handsome clocks at a low price in pay, and having made for myself as many very handsome cases for them, I put them together, boxed them up, and in the fall of 1810, I had them put on board a schooner bound for Norfolk in Virginia, and went myself to that place with them to sell. I succeeded in selling them all to a Spanish merchant to take the, to the West Indies on speculation. I then started the desperate adventure of laying out all my cash for flour and returning home with it in the month of February 1811. So he brought these clocks all the way to Norfolk, uh, to sell them to the southern market, and they ended up going to the, the West Indies trade. Uh, this is from the, uh, regarding the same journey. He said, we, we could not get around 
uh, Cape Cod and to Barnstable Bay. We had therefore to turn directly back and was out all night in a very cold and blowing snowstorm. The vessel struck the shoal several times and we were in very great danger of being cast away and lost. The hands were all much frozen and the vessel the next morning, much loaded with ice, we arrived in Ch Chatham Harbor. Nearly, nearly all I was worth in the world was in the flour that was on board and that not injured. So imagine the risks that these people took. They would place themselves and their entire worldly belongings on a, on a ship and, and go out into the ocean in the dead of winter without any idea of the weather forecast. It was, uh, uh, it was uh, dangerous to be sure. Uh, this is regarding a, a different trip. He says, uh, in, in the long winter of 1804 and 5, he says, I took a voyage to Philadelphia and took with me about a dozen handsome timepieces and about two or three clocks. I remained in Philadelphia over a month and finally sold my timepieces and clocks at a low price. I laid out my money in corn that I had put in barrels, shipped it to Boston. My corn arrived safe and I sold it at a small profit. This was very common for, for the clock makers to uh, trade their clocks for um, corn or flour, and uh, they were very happy to turn a profit on, on whatever it was they took back. They, they, they did not want the, the cash. Uh, here's a clock that is signed uh, by the partnership of Monroe and Whiting. This is uh, William's brother, Nathaniel Monroe, and Samuel Whiting. And Nathaniel actually moved to Baltimore and, uh, and, and settled, settled there. Uh, and he maintained his partnership with Samuel Whiting in, in Concord. And uh, Whiting was making the clockworks in Concord, shipping them to Baltimore to be sold by, uh, by Nathaniel Monroe. And this is interesting in that the, the, uh, the clock has three hands off the center, which is not something you would typically find in any clock made in New England. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen it on a New England clock. But it was uh, very common to, to find clocks in the South, in Pennsylvania, uh, in, in uh, Maryland, that have this arrangement we call four hands off the center. Typically, a Boston clock would have a little second hand We have a little seconds hand here and a calendar down below. Um, and, and so there are a number of, of these clocks that exist in the South today that uh, uh, that have this arrangement and the, and the movements were actually made in Concord, Massachusetts. Uh, here's another one with the same four hands off the center. It descended in the Ransom family of Charlestown, West Virginia. Here's one of Nathaniel Monroe's banjo clocks, or patent timepieces. So by, uh, in 1817, he moved to, uh, to Baltimore, and uh, he was advertising um, like this. He says, uh, he keeps constantly for sale elegant eight-day clocks and Willard's patent timepieces. Now, um, this, in 1817, Simon Willard's patent had already expired. And he was taking advantage of that Willard name by putting it in his, in his ad. Uh, he didn't need to do that. And in fact, uh, Simon Willard uh, uh, got tired of other uh, clockmakers using his name to make money. And at one point, he advertised warning the public against what he called spurious timepieces. Uh, he called them vile performances, warning the public against buying them. So whether he was referring to Monroe's clocks, I, I, I don't know. But uh, uh, at one point, Nathaniel Monroe advertised that he had four dozen eight-day Willard's patent timepieces. And you can bet they were not made by Willard. Uh, here are a couple of his ads, the one on the left. Uh, it was in a Massachusetts uh, newspaper, the one on the right. Um, this is advertising in Baltimore. Again, he's, uh, he's advertising Willard's patent timepieces that Willard didn't make. Um, and he says, clockmakers can be supplied at all times with elegant mahogany clock cases and movements. So he was selling his brother's cases and the movements that were made by himself and, uh, and his partner. This is from one of his ads. He says uh, uh, in 1817, he has nine dozen clock movements, a part of which are calculated to carry the day of the, of the month and seconds from the center, like the one I just showed you. 
He also has 10 dozen clock castings, so the rough castings to be finished by a clockmaker. Um, 24 dozen bells, 6 dozen hands, 20 dozen forged work and pinions. This represents uh, a couple of hundred clocks. Uh, it's, it's an amazing output. And he, was, he was targeting the, uh, uh, the clock makers in the, in the region to sell them the movements. Uh, here's undoubtedly one of the movements that he sold to a, uh, to a local artisan. Um, this is uh, a clock that was sold at uh, Parc Renee in 1956. But it's signed on the dial with, uh, it says Nathaniel Monroe, Concord Mass, but it's in a Baltimore type case. So this was certainly one of the ones that he sold down there rather than in Massachusetts. In another ad, he says, clockmakers are also invited to call at this establishment if they wish to be supplied with common weekday clock movements or movements which are calculated to carry the month in the center with common or deadbeat escapements. He's also selling dials and parts. And this, to me, is the smoking gun. This is, this is a, uh, a clock that I just found a couple of weeks ago. Um, it is signed by an obscure Baltimore clockmaker. Uh, his name is Joseph Rice, uh, and it's in a, uh, in a local case. But this is a movement that was made by Monroe and Whiting. And uh, I know you're, you're, you're not uh, uh, clock experts, but um, uh, trust me that, that this is like a fingerprint, the way this movement is made. And uh, so here, are, here is one of the movements that he was marketing to the, uh, to the local clock maker. Uh, now we come to John Bailey. Uh, he's the principal character in my story, uh, and he's actually the, the, the character that brought me down the, the road that has led here. Uh, he, uh, uh, he worked in Hanover, Massachusetts. Uh, he was a, a staunch abolitionist and a Quaker preacher. And uh, he, uh, I was surprised during my research for Harbor Home to learn that this local Hanover clockmaker who worked uh, a few miles south of Boston was making frequent trips to the south to sell clocks. And uh, he had at least two agents in North Carolina that were selling clocks for him. And he actually advertised um, his, uh, his work in, in South Carolina. Here's a later photograph of him, uh, which is just a great photo at age 90. I hope I look this 50. <laughs> um, but here's his ad from the Edenton Gazette in 1819. And he says, John Bailey Jr. from Massachusetts respectfully informs his friends and the public that he has taken a shop at Elizabeth City, where he intends <coughs> carrying on the clock and watch repairing business for a few weeks. So he, he would set up shop, brought his tools with him, and, and uh, he was looking for business. And he goes on to say, a few clocks and timepieces of superior quality on hand. So he brought some clocks with him to sell. Let's look at uh, the area that we're, we're talking about, and the, uh, uh, the, the names of the towns have uh, gotten corrupted a little bit here, but um, here we've got uh, Williamsburg and Norfolk, where uh, William Monroe traveled with his, uh, with his load of clocks. Uh, and then uh, uh, here we have Murfreesboro. Now, that's, a, that's an important town uh, in terms of, of John Bailey. I had never heard of it before. Um, but it was actually designated as an official port of, en of entry uh, by Congress in 1790. The reason for that is that the, the, uh, the big ocean-going vessels could actually travel up the Meharan River to the port here, which was as deep as they could penetrate into this uh, rich uh, farmland. So um, they did a tremendous trade there, uh, sending uh, they, their, their goods out uh, and uh, the produce and, and getting uh, uh, merchandise uh, coming in. And down uh, down here we have Elizabeth City and Edenton, which are places where John B Bailey was selling his merchandise. The Earlham College Library has some fantastic correspondence between John Bailey Jr. and Josiah Parker. Parker was a merchant uh, in Murfreesboro who was selling clocks for Bailey on consignment. Um, and uh, uh, Parker's son, Nathan, actually became an apprentice of Bailey and went back to Hanover with him. So uh, to take a piece of, of this, this letter, which was from uh, 5th month, 1823, um, 
he says, if thou canst purchase some feathers for me at as good a quality as those that I had of thee, uh, and any uh, and any price between 33 and 50 cents per pound, I wish thou would, for I think that such feathers at 50 cents would be as good as cash. So he prefers getting feathers than to be paid for the for the flock that uh, that was sold. He said, I want. Uh, I will take any quantity from 25 to 50 weight or more. And that's a lot of feathers. <laughs> uh, in the same letter, he says, Cotton has lately, lately taken a considerable rise owing to the great crickets at New Orleans. I'm uh, not sure if that's a crickets or packets, but uh, he's referring to boats anyway. Uh, at New Orleans and thereabouts. I sold mine about an hour after I received thy letter for 12 cents which netted me about $3 from costs and charges, which was rather, rather better than to have taken the cash. Another uh, letter gives us an idea of, of the kind of life that, that uh, these gentlemen led. He says, we have had two or three very severe snowstorms since we got home, one of which came the last of the third month or first of the fourth, was the most severe I think I ever knew. The snow was very much drifted and was 15 feet deep in some places in the road. Now, Rex, we left one of our trunks at Elizabeth to be sent on by some vessel. We left it in the care of Captain Reed. He mentioned that there was a vessel thence loading not far from Elizabeth that belonged to Hingham. Hingham is next to Hanover. <clears throat> <clears throat> that he would try to get the trunk on board of him, but, but whether he did or not, I have not yet heard. But that vessel sailed the day before the storm and has not yet been heard of since, and without doubt, she is lost and all the hands with her. <clears throat> we expect to hear soon whether the trunk was on board of her or not. I had considerable property in it, and, <clears throat> excuse me, in it, and besides, a considerable part of Nathan's clothes. <clears throat> so, to continue with the story, that vessel did go down, and Bailey lost all of his tools, and his apprentice lost his, uh, his clothing. Uh, <clears throat> Bailey's uh, daughter wrote her memoirs years later, and she said that, that Bailey was actually planning to travel on that ship, but decided at the last minute <clears throat> to go overland, so that he survived. This is another letter, 6th month, uh, 1823, again, from Bailey to Josiah Parker. And there's just so much great information in these, in these letters. Here he says, I have received about 300 bushels of corn from Isaac Overman. Isaac Overman was another one of his agents in North Carolina. But I cannot sell it for so much as it costs. Corn is about 60 cents per bushel here now and I expect more corn of him yet. Now that's a lot of corn, it's over $200 worth, which is about the price of, of three tall case clocks at $65 or $70 a piece. So he's, so he's, he's taking a significant amount of produce in, in the trade. Uh, from uh, uh, this, this letter, he says, uh, I will endeavor to send on two clocks this fall for Burton and Ray of the description mentioned and super fine. I think of writing to Isaac Overman soon to send two of the clocks he has to thee, for I think they will not sell soon in his hands. I also calculate to send one or two with pine cases this fall. Now, here it is in 1823. There are almost no tall case grandfather clocks being produced in the country anymore. They're out of fashion but he's still selling them in the South. And the reason he's, uh, he's, he's uh, producing some of the pine cases is because they're cheaper. He needs to compete with the, with the less expensive clocks that are being produced in Connecticut now. And uh, this name right here, uh, Ray, he's talking about uh, sending down two clocks for Burton and Ray. So this is bespoke work. These are, these are orders uh, for, for clocks that uh, that his agent made arrangements for, for him to, uh, to sell. And here is Ray's store. 
Um, it's in Murfreesboro, North Carolina. It was built to circa 1790 to 1800. It was the store of Joseph G. Ray, who the clock was made for, and his brother William. <clears throat> this is the oldest uh, commercial brick structure that's still standing in North Carolina. And uh, in, uh, in 1819, uh, the uh, partnership of William and Joseph Ray advertised that they had 300 fancy and Windsor chairs uh, for sale in their shop. They sold uh, furniture from, from this location. So Joseph G. Ray became very wealthy selling his furniture, and that's why he was able to buy such an expensive box. Uh, a very, very small segment of the population could afford, afford a clock at this point. Um, and this is, this is his home, uh, built in 1808. Um, uh, he had a brother that, uh, uh, Ray had come from Boston, but he settled in North Carolina. He had a brother back in Boston that was involved in the shipping business with them, and, and uh, so they were sending merchandise back and forth. And he became, uh, became quite wealthy. It was later written that his <coughs> home was beautifully furnished with the most costly furniture and paintings. And the clock would have been one of those pieces. And here's the clock. Uh, it's inscribed on the dial, warranted for by Jay Bailey for Joseph G. Ray. I wish I had a better photograph of it. This was uh, 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 illustrated in a little clock pamphlet in 1948. And I chased the descendants of this guy back and forth through the country, and finally learned that it had been sold out of the family uh, many years ago. But um, it's great to be able to connect the dots like that with a uh, with an object. Here's another clock made for a southern uh, client by John Bailey Jr. This one was made for Thomas Figures Northley for his uh, plantation home called Woodbourne in Roxville, uh, Birdie County, North Carolina. Uh, it's just a spectacular clock in a Roxbury style case. Um, this is a case that would have been made south of Boston in the, in the Hingham Hanover area. It has a, uh, a rocking ship dial here that moves back and forth with the motion of the, of the pendulum. And uh, there's a close up of the, of the movement, and it has a, a, it's numbered. It's number 123, dated. <coughs> 1819 in the Quaker style, number rather than naming their uh, their months. But what's interesting about this clock is it was made just a few months before that advertisement that I showed you uh, for for Bailey uh, working in Elizabeth City. This is undoubtedly a clock that he brought with him on that trip and sold to a uh, uh, to uh, a client. Uh, and that's why it doesn't have the name of the owner on the on the dial. The bespoke work uh, would have been inscribed with the with the name of the owner. Uh, and this is Woodbourne. This is where the where the clock uh, resided. Uh, it's about forty miles up the Roanoke River from uh, from Eden. And and uh, the uh, the relatively simple. Uh, plantation home here belies the activity that surrounded it. Uh, just a few years uh, um, uh, later, when, when his son was running the plantation, uh, it, it had 150 slaves and 4,000 acres. And in one year, they produced 10,000 bushels of corn, 67,000 pounds of cotton, 671 gallons of brandy from the orchards, and they sold about 300 hogs. So this was a very successful, uh, wealthy man that that uh, purchased the fine clock for himself. Um, this is the, uh, the work for that clock. I just want to uh, show how these things were, were shipped. And if I turn it on its side, this is how they shipped them, laying on their back with the works actually nailed into the case, right in place, and they would install a little wooden block to carry the weight of the movement. And then they would box it up and, uh, and, and ship it. Uh, it, uh, it cost 50 cents to have a, a 58 cents to have a crate made for one of these for, for shipping. That's what William Monroe charged his brothers, 58 cents. Uh, another Bailey block made for the Southern Market. This one's for Colonel Hardy Cross, um, and it's uh, it's inscribed with the, with his name on the on the dial here. So this is one that was that was ordered by him. And there is Colonel Hardy Cross. The plantation was called. Farmer's Delight, uh, his photo of him in 1845. 
Another bespoke uh, uh, John Bailey plot, this one for Theophilus White of Bethel Township, Perkman's <laughs> Perkman's uh, County, North Carolina. Uh, this was uh, in an exhibit at the Valentine Museum in 1967 that was curated by uh, Charles Navis. Uh, a wonderful old photograph of the park. And here's still another one. Uh, thank you to Sumter for, uh, for, for sending me to see the fascinating character that owned this clock in, uh, in North Carolina. He was a, a crusty gentleman that I guarantee you before I arrived a Yankee had never set foot in his house. <laughs> Sadly, my, my uh, camera was mal whoops, was malfunctioning that day, so uh, so I did not get a good picture of the clock. But this this clock had been in his family since it was made, and it's and it's never uh, it's never left Elizabeth City. So uh, it's just so cool to find these things that are still in the families. Uh, and it's interesting to note that. Uh, the clocks that Bailey shipped to the South very often were signed John Bailey Jr. Hanover Mass or Hanover MA, which would not be typical of clocks from the period. They usually wouldn't tell the state that they worked in other than the ones that were made for export. And this is the house that that, that, that clock resided in, Judge, Judge People's house that was there for many years. So let's, uh, let's move to a different clock maker. This is Reuben Merriman. Cheshire, Connecticut. And this is a clock that was sold by uh, Brunk Auctions uh, this, this past year. And uh, <coughs> this is a clock maker that seemed to have a lock on a, a, a relatively small uh, area where he was uh, he was selling clocks in, uh, uh, in South Carolina. And this is what was written uh, about 50 years later, in, in, uh, or 60 years later, 1890. Um, it was written about his clocks, a very peculiar but sure mark of prosperity, and this is uh, in the town of Newbury, South Carolina. Very pe peculiar but sure mark of prosperity was the possession of the Merriman clock. When a man had succeeded in accumulating considerable property, he usually purchased one of these clocks. They were made by Reuben Merriman at Cheshire, Connecticut, and brought to Charleston by sale, and from the city transported in wagons to various points in the state. One of these old clocks, which has been running for more than half a century, is now in the possession of the National Bank of Newbury, where it still tells about the passing hours with unfailing regularity. And I think there were several clockmakers that made a connection somewhere in the South and then sold clocks in that in that tight little area, more or less the way Bailey did in the in the uh, in Edenton, Elizabeth City, and Murfreesboro. Uh, so now we come to the uh, the production uh, clocks. Uh, uh, a little bit later, um, this is a wood movement clock. Well, the ones that we've been talking about previously are uh, clocks with brass movements. Um, during the first quarter of the 19th century, these became more and more common. They were less expensive than a brass works clock. Uh, this this set of works would have been about. Uh, $16, which was a third of the price of a set of works for uh, a brass clock. Um, but they were not as accurate, not uh, not as highly regarded, uh, and in fact some uh, clock makers did not want to work on them. Uh, William McCabe, who we met earlier from Richmond, he advertised that he repairs um, clocks of all descriptions, wooden clocks accepted. <laughs> Uh, this is a wonderful inscription on the paper label for a William Leavenworth set of clockworks for a tall clock. Um, and this would have been uh, made in 1807. This is written by a clock peddler, and he says, The su subscriber has on hand a few of the above clocks for sale, for which he will take and pay neat stock or sheep. Neat stock being dairy cattle. So here he wants to trade. Uh, clocks, clock movements for dairy cattle or sheep. It's dated uh, July 1807, Jacob Merrill Jr., uh, Plymouth, Connecticut. Uh, 
here is, I mean, here's one of those clock peddlers. Um, now these, the, the South was crawling with these guys in the second quarter of the 19th century, and they, they did not have a good reputation, nor did their clocks. Um, the Southern states tired of this guy. Would you let your daughter go out with this guy? <laughs> the uh, Southern states tired of sending revenues north. Clock peddlers and, and with the furniture merchants. So uh, several states uh, enacted taxes where uh, clocks or merchandise that was brought in that was not manufactured in their state was was heavily taxed. And uh, so the uh, Connecticut clockmakers had to uh, try to to find a way around that. We'll talk about that again in, in a moment. Uh, this is a, uh, a clock with a case. Uh, attributed to Elijah Warner, a Lexington, Kentucky cabinet maker, who was a prolific clock case maker. And uh, he was ordering sets of works in large quantities from Silas Hoadley in Plymouth, Connecticut. And here's one of those wooden works uh, movements. Um, at one point in 1823, Elijah Warner ordered 50 sets of clock works at the same time from uh, from. A tremendous number. So uh, here's how the, uh, the Connecticut clockmaking firms got around those uh, those tax laws. Uh, this is a clock that was made by Seth Thomas in Plymouth, Connecticut, and it was printed with a label that used to say "Patent clocks invented by Eli Terry, made and sold by Seth Thomas." It used to say right here. Well. Uh, what they did was they overpasted the labels. If you look very carefully, there's a seam right there. So they covered up the name of the actual manufacturer and substituted, uh, made and sold at Waterbury, North Carolina for right in the key. Uh, so what they were doing was, uh, uh, in some instances, they would manufacture all the parts in Connecticut and ship them along with the labor to the southern states where they would uh, assemble the clocks uh, and then market them in, in those states and they would they would come up with labels that were appropriate and I'm sure that sometimes they completed the clock and sent the whole thing down there and smuggled it into the um, and smuggled it into the states because that's what we Yankees do. <laughs> Here's a, here's a wonderful lab, label uh, in, in a similar clock, and th these clocks are uh, second quarter of the 19th century. Um, this one says, improved clocks made and sold by Pettibone and Company, Richmond, Virginia. The public may be assured that these clocks are equal, if not superior, to any made in the North. That's because they were made in the North. <laughs> <laughs> and just to cover a few of the states that are doing this, and, and, and some of these uh, Connecticut clockmakers set up what they call depots in the southern states where they would sell the clocks. And some of it was legitimate activity, but, uh, but some was not. So these are Connecticut clocks that were sold in the south. And uh, um, this is, uh, here are a couple from North Carolina. This one says uh, Wilmington and that one, Waterbury. Uh, south Carolina, we have Columbia, uh, Hamburg, and uh, Woodville. Tennessee, this one's from Nashville, again, Connecticut uh, blocks, and then Georgia, uh, Greensboro, Savannah, Macon, and uh, Augusta. Now this was intended to be my last slide, but as if to prove that the research is, is never done uh, and, uh, and the scholarship uh, it, it is never complete, uh, just a, a few days ago, I received photographs of still another John Bailey clock made for a Southern client, and uh, uh, I was able to sneak it into this uh, this PowerPoint at the last minute. Um, it still belongs to a descendant of the original owner. Um, it, it's in the Baltimore area now. The clock was made for this gentleman, Nathan Winslow, of Elizabeth City, North Carolina, about 1820. And uh, it's this wonderful Roxbury style uh, case. And the name of the plantation where the clock was housed was called Piney Woods uh, near Elizabeth City. Uh, so uh, the search goes on. And if you, uh, if, you, if you find or hear about any John Bailey Jr. clocks or historians in the South, I would love to hear about them.